We're reading in the book of, uh, and I'm going to give you time to find it. It's the book of Habakkuk, <laughs> chapter 2. I'll try and give you a bit of time to find it. Um, I can guide you that um, you need to be after Daniel and before Matthew. You are in that region of the minor prophets, the Habakkuks, the Mikas, uh, the Zephaniahs. That's where you are going to find um, the book of Habakkuk. Uh, I had this professor who, who would say it's the book of Habakkuk. So the first time I heard him say it, man, I looked around thinking, where is this book in the Bible? <laughs> because I've never heard of Habakkuk before. Um, I realized that the seniors at the college were looking for Habakkuk. So I said, oh, okay, that's the book. So you will please help me by saying amen if you have found it. Amen. And we're going to read there verse 4. Behold the proud... His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Yes, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus this morning, what a privilege to wake up to a rainy day. It is an answered prayer to a farmer somewhere. And we wake up to rejoice with those who prayed for rain. To thank the God of heaven for hearing them. And therefore allowing nature which he designed to do what is necessary. We thank you for the sunny days when they are around, for those two are in answer to a prayer. And so, Father, I pray that on this rainy day, may we join those who will thank you and worship you for it. May we be granted the spirit of using it wisely this day. And that when the sun sets, we may not be counted among fools who have wasted another day on earth. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. We acknowledge that there are many who did not wake up. Father, there are those who are not alive this morning because of wars in their countries. Some finally succumbed to hunger. Some were killed in car accidents and other types of accidents. Others were murdered in robberies or any other crime that was taking place. Others succumbed to the pain of disease, either at homes or in hospitals. There are so many reasons under the sun why many of your children didn't wake up. And Father, we acknowledge that one of these days it will be one of us. And Father, we do not know the mood. This is why we have to thank you for the gift of life. Because one day, you will step aside and allow sin to do to us what it has been doing for thousands of years. When that day comes, may we not weep for a life never lived. May we be able to look into death and be able to say it was good to walk among the living. But more than anything, it was good to worship this God. Mm. And so, Father, again, I thank you for the gift of life. I thank you that your wisdom and grace saw it fit to shelter us for another day. And I thank you that you will imbue us with the wisdom of how to use this day. For all this is possible in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. There are words that are spoken very easily in the Christian faith. Words that we use 
so many times in a day. And perhaps I belong to the category of those who could be described as weak. Because I would find myself getting lost in the meaning of these words. Feeling isolated and alone in church, I will listen to speaker after speaker use these words. And this is not a phenomenon of my childhood. Even now as a pastor, I will sit in a church. I will listen to my colleagues preach and others teach, make presentations and comments in lessons. And I will find myself feeling alone and afraid, not because they have said anything wrong, but because I find myself not understanding the meanings of the words they've used, and I feel that I am not good enough as a Christian. Because I listen to the audience say amen, and it becomes clear to me I'm the only one who is struggling with the meaning of what has just been said. Everyone else gets it. It even feels worse as a pastor because I will struggle with these things and sometimes people will ask me on these issues. Sometimes God will even give me a message where I will have to use these words. And I will use these words guided by the Holy Spirit and yet what I am not able to explain to the audience is that prior to the sermon, during the sermon and after the sermon, I am wrestling with God about what does he mean on the very words he has instructed me to use. One of those words is faith. What does faith really mean? And I've heard this word probably now accounts to millions of times in my Christian walk. And I've certainly used it in those many millions of times. I was one of the contributors in using the word. But sometimes you sit and you reflect and you think, but does anyone really truly know what faith is? Can anyone really come up with an absolute sure definition that when you have this, you have faith? And again, as I said, these are Challenges that I look at and I face shamefully because I find myself surrounded by a mature Christian population and audience that seems to know exactly what it's talking about. Nothing is as difficult as being in an audience where everyone knows what they are talking about and you, you are the only one who doesn't seem to know what is going on. I remember growing up as a child, the first time in church, I heard the name Ellen White, and now I was actually old enough to think what it means. I heard this presenter in my church saying, Ellen White says, and I thought to myself, oh, okay. And then throughout the day, I heard this name Ellen White a couple of more times. Then I heard it again the following Sabbath, and the Sabbath after that, and the Sabbath after that, and I began to worry that there was a member in my local church I didn't know, and her name was Ellen White. It bothered me, because I thought I knew everybody in church. And they kept talking about this lady whose name was Ellen White, and I just didn't know who she is in church. And as much as... I may have a, a, an experience that exposes me to be fairly stupid among you. I began to look for this lady in church. Now, growing up in rural KZN with very little English, at least I knew her surname was white. So I assumed that she was light-skinned. I thought it describes maybe how she looks. 
So growing up as a child, I would try in church to look at those light-skinned ladies who are educated and see if one of them will say something wise enough for me to finally say, aha, I have found this lady called Ellen White in church. How often we use words and never ever think whether the other person understands what I mean. The prophet here, Habakkuk, and I must confess that in the Bible, I love the prophets that contend with God. Because in some ways, they tell my story. I have great respect for the prophets and individuals whose relationship with God was very well understood. They obeyed. I'm drawn to guys like Habakkuk and Job and Solomon, individuals who actually didn't find it easy to figure out what exactly is going on. The this, this stupid ones like me, if one may put it that way. The guys who, when everyone was saying amen, they were still stuck thinking, but what am I missing? What, what have you revealed to them that I'm not getting? The prophet Habakkuk lives around the time when the Israelites are soon approaching their journey to exile. Nebuchadnezzar will soon arrive. And Habakkuk writes his book in about a year or two before their arrival. And this man first initially, where he started is not where his book then went. Habakkuk was a prophet that was troubled by injustice. Why are the good suffering? Why are the wicked doing well? Where is the God of justice? Habakkuk was not bothered by this initially at a national level. He just wanted to know Why, where is God when a girl sent to university to study by her parents who have no money have to receive a phone call that she was raped and stabbed to death when they prayed for her when she left home when God knew very well she was their only hope. She was their firstborn. She was supposed to be the one who delivers the family out of trouble. So Habakkuk is bothered by the injustice of life. Why is it that when the poor are still bred, they go to prison for two years. But when the rich still billions, they are able to delay cases for 15, 20, 30 years. And all Habakkuk wants to know is tell me God, will there ever come a time when we who believe in doing right will actually live a life that shows that we have not been stupid for our faith. Habakkuk begins at a personal level. When you read chapter 1 verse 1 to 4, Habakkuk's prayer and, 
and questions to God have nothing to do with the nations. Why did the Americans attack Iraq and Afghanistan? Why is it that Saudi Arabia is committing a genocide in Yemen and no one is saying anything? He's not there yet. He started at a personal level. He just wants to know, Lord, why is injustice prevailing? Why is a woman told she is inferior for being a woman as if there is somewhere where we wrote a gender exam, women failed it and men passed it? Why am I being punished for what was not my choice? Why must somebody leave Europe in a ship Find me in the country of my ancestors where you, God, allowed my people to evolve. Why is that person telling me I'm inferior in my homeland? I did not go to theirs to bother them. Why am I a nothing where I belong? That's all Habakkuk wants to know. Why is there injustice? But what bothers Habakkuk the most is that this is not injustice he reads about in the news from pagan nations. What bothers him is it's injustice he sees every day in Israel among the chosen people, the people of God. This bothers him the most. See, he's not worried so much about what happens out there. He doesn't live there. He's bothered by the fact that the pain he sees, the injustice he sees, happens within Israel. It's in Israel that a woman is a nobody. It's in Israel that he sees racism. It's in Israel that he sees leaders who get away with corruption. It's in Israel that he sees the poor being punished for very little crimes excessively. It's in Israel that women are being raped. He sees all this there. It's not an injustice if it doesn't take place in the presence of an expected justice. See, you can't allow me to make an illustration on, play, on matters of fact, not casting aspersions on character. About a week or so ago in this country, in this province, they buried a notorious gangster. Um, in his funeral, he was shot somewhere here in Cape Town. In his funeral, his family spoke about how he was such a good loving man. This is a guy who raped people's daughters murdered people and in his funeral his family is crying talking about how he was such a good man a misunderstood man what is there to misunderstand about the fact that your father had a girl raped seated on a chair watching and laughing while his foot soldiers were taking turns raping her so Habakkuk says I see great pain and I see a society that is ignorant of it. I see pastors on television blessing politicians who have looted billions and this is where Habakkuk is stuck. What happened to justice? When did we stop speaking out against the wrong? How, how did we get there where in a funeral of a rapist we speak of a good man? Where we bless a politician with the hands of the church? Because remember, we are now invoking God on a somebody who should be facing their crimes. 
And I'm not saying people shouldn't get saved. There's a difference between blessing somebody and ministering to somebody to repent so that Jesus may save them. Habakkuk has this problem. Unfortunately for him, the answer would take him somewhere and it comes to the words I started speaking about. God says to him, I hear you. Here is what I'm going to do. Because Israel has become an unjust people, I am sending the Babylonians as my rod of discipline. Because there is injustice in Israel, I am sending the Babylonians to come and discipline everyone. Habakkuk cries again and says, Lord, no. No. Babylonians are ruthless. They are pagans. They will murder us. They will rape. And so what, what now Habakkuk is saying is, Lord, if we are going to be disciplined, can you not do it? Because the ones you are going to send are an evil people. A ruthless people. And here's what Habakkuk doesn't understand. And here I'm going to deal with the hypocrisy of justice. Or the hypocrisy of the expectation of justice. Many people who have read these verses have then looked to critique God to say, but really, why would God send a pagan nation? But you are missing the point. In, 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 in verse 1 to 4 of chapter 1, it was Habakkuk who saw injustice in Israel. He saw rape in Israel. He saw murder in Israel. And then God says, I am sending you a people who are going to rape and murder all of you. And then he says, no, Lord, how can you send people to rape and murder us? That's the point. God is saying, I am sending someone from outside who will do to you what you've been doing to each other so that you realize that you are not different. You've been raping and murdering, but because you believe you are Israel, you have judged yourselves in a better scale. Because you believe you are chosen, you've been doing the same filth as others, but because you convinced yourself you are chosen, now that I send an outsider to do the same, you suddenly cry that I should think again. Where were your cries when you were doing it to each other? In other words, what God is, trying, is, is simply portraying here is that Christians have a tendency to do the same thing as non-believers. But somehow when an outsider does it, you can see wickedness in it. It is in this Seventh-day Adventist church that pastors have raped girls in camp meetings, in youth camps, here. It is here in this church that men are beating up their wives every day, then showing up on Sabbath to lead the church, here. It is in this church that there are businessmen who participate with politicians in scandals that rob the poor of what they deserve. Here, we receive tithe here from men and women here who have stolen from government here and we bless them here after they have looted the state here, leaving people without the resources they deserve in this church. These are not things that did not happen in Israel. They happened inside the border. Now that God sends the Babylonian to discipline you, you act as if the Babylonian is somehow a worse sinner. It was here. 
that people lost their wives in our presence and we said nothing and their wives remarried our elders and we kept quiet. It was here. It was here. This injustice takes place inside buildings where the name of God is called every day. And this is why when God says, I am sending the Babylonians, Habakkuk says, no, this is the hypocrisy of justice. That when it is being done under your terms, you want a light divine hand to discipline you. But when it's done outside, you want heaven to hammer. And God doesn't understand. Habakkuk, you told me that there is injustice. I am sending an unjust nation. Where is the problem? You are an unjust Israel. I am sending an unjust nation. Basically, I'm sending yourselves to yourselves. And it is very difficult to wrestle with God when he makes you face the mirror. I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm blessed with the opportunity to be a, a father to, to three boys. One of the most frustrating things about being a father is to see yourself in the mirror. Each of my sons have taken some of my characteristics that I really did not like. But I didn't know I didn't like them until I saw them. Like when my wife used to say, you know, you are very annoying when you do this. I did not get it. Now I've got boys who are doing it. And sometimes when they do these things and I get frustrated, my wife usually will say to me, we ask back, do you understand what I'm saying? And sometimes it is very difficult for us to face at the mirror when God shows us because the Babylonians were the Israelites in the mirror. The only difference is they had been calling the name of God while doing field. Now somebody who doesn't call the name of God while doing field is coming. The only difference here is the hypocrisy is not the same. You have been doing field but invoking the name of God. These guys don't care about God. They do their field clean. The difference is you've been raping and then you preach the next day. These guys are going to rape you and kill you. And they are not going to pray to anybody. And that's the challenge that Christianity has. Learning to walk away from this belief that when we do filth, we have entered a better position than those who don't know God. Habakkuk is shattered and here we bring our message to land. Habakkuk cries out to God and says, could you not find another way? Could you not find another way to discipline us? Find another way. Habakkuk himself is claiming ignorance. As an Israelite, he understands the history of Israel. That it has always been how God works. When they no longer listen to him, he hands them over to an outsider. But then God says to him, There are things that I want you to understand that, that first you have cried and I hear you. Tough times are coming. However, I'm going to teach you Habakkuk how to deal with the tough times. He says, now that the tough times are coming, let me tell you a situation and two things that you will need to do. Situation number one. As the tough times are coming, you will all begin to question my presence in your lives. You will wonder if I still love you or if I'm still there. You will wonder if I still hear prayer when you pray. You will run to and fro reading, trying to find verses that will comfort you just to prove that I'm still around. That's the situation. He's saying, brace yourself. Tough times are coming and you will wonder whether am I still God. You will face situations where as you pray, it will feel more as if you are telling yourself something. And I'm sure many, okay, let me correct that because like I said, the foundation of this may be the stupidity and the immaturity of my own faith. 
So rather than saying there are many of us, I can confess that I personally go through things where sometimes I pray and I literally feel like I am God because the only one hearing what I'm saying is me. Where you are going through a process where you can feel like God is not listening to this. In all honesty, I can get up and walk away. There was no heaven listening. And God says, you're going to go through that. You are going to go through difficulties where it's going to feel like you have to be your own God because I'm not around. There are going to be times when things are going to get so bad that you are going to cry to me and I'm not going to intervene and that is when you are going to find evidence that you need to look elsewhere. Tough times are coming, Habakkuk. You are going to look for Bible verses that will explain what you are going through and they are not going to be there. Each and every one you read will almost come close to your situation. Just when you think it arrives, it's going to take a turn and go elsewhere. And you are going to feel the isolation that neither scripture nor prayer understands what you are going through. And I want to thank Jesus for those of you who have never gone through that. Furthermore, I want to plead with him, may you never go through it. It is a dark valley that some of us have walked to be where neither verse nor prayer can come through for you. Sometimes I'll sit in church and I'll listen to people, uh, uh, especially in Christian context, talking. You know, in the past two, three years, our country has woken up to mental illnesses. And I love that about us, that we finally caught up to the reality of mental illness. The challenge is in church, when I listen to people discuss mental illness, depression, and other things, they'll say things like, you know, when you feel depressed, pray, and I think, my word. Somebody here has never been depressed. Never tell a depressed person when you're depressed, pray. Depression is the very science of not knowing how to pray for yourself. Depression buries you so deep. You are not intellectually unaware what the verses say. You are existentially absent in even knowing what they mean for you. I listened to a presentation, someone saying, these are verses you can read when you are going through depression. And it became one of those moments again when I had to say, God, this is one of those times where in the Adventist church, I'm the idiot. This is one of those times I'm just going to shut up because all of these guys have really gone through a very powerful life. I'm the only one here who has gone through a life where I didn't even know how to read a verse in my darkest times. I hadn't stopped becoming a believer. I was drowning deep beneath. So when you hear people say verses like, when you are depressed, this is what you go through, you immediately realize, I so do not fit here. So God says to them, brace yourselves. Tough times do come. The second thing that God says is that then there will be two groups. As you observe this, and you now are convinced that the Lord has tarried. This is where Hebrews borrows that verse. He who is coming will come and will not tarry. Meanwhile, the just shall live by his faith. The writer of Hebrews borrowed it here from Habakkuk. Because then God says, then you will wait for my deliverance and time will pass and I will not deliver you. And it will feel like I have tarried, I no longer care. Then he says, then you will split into two groups. Group number one will resort to pride. In other words, they will look for means to save themselves because there is no God. This is, this is group number one. It says the proud will look into themselves and they will say, look, every man for himself now, survival of the fittest, powerful saints start coming up. God helps those who help themselves and all sorts of wisdom will rise. Now it is a division of how to react to the problem. There are those who are searching for answers by going through life on their own terms because God has failed us. It says then there will be group two. He says, group two, but the just shall live by faith. I want you to be realistic with me this morning. 
He did not say the just will survive the war that was coming. He didn't say that when the Babylonians come, the just will be saved. He didn't say the just won't get raped. He didn't say when the Babylonians come, they will attack only the houses of the wicked and the just will survive. He didn't say the just will remain in Israel while the wicked are carried away. He simply said the just shall live by faith. Because war did come. The just died. The just were raped. The houses of the just were burned to the ground. The just were carried to slavery. How do we know? Because in Daniel chapter 1, we are introduced to the, the just. Where? Are they in Israel? No. In Babylon. They too were carried. So then, what did faith do for them? If the just need faith and the just are now in Babylon, what did faith do? Why didn't faith stop them from being kidnapped? Why didn't faith make the enemy march around their houses? I do not claim to have a conclusive answer to faith. But I'm going to share with you now what at least I can confirm God has revealed to me insofar as the scripture is concerned. Faith does not prove itself in giving you the outcome you want. Faith proves itself in giving you the God you need. Your outcome may not change. Faith simply makes sure that as you face this unbearable outcome, face it with and in God. If you want to see the practical application of what I'm saying, it is the same Hebrew boys that were carried from that war who finally understood what Habakkuk was telling them before they left home. Listen to these young men speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. O oh Lord the king, we will not bow to your idol. If you throw us in the lake of fire, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, faith had taught them, you don't always get the ending you want, but you will get the God you need. Amen. Hence they say to him, the outcome may be we will burn. That is not what we want. However, no. Because our God is able, we will still not bow. So this morning, I've not come to promise you victory. I've not come to say to you, shout, I receive. I will not tell you that 2020 is your season. Because in 2020, your mother may die. You may die. In 2020, you may get retrenched. In 2020, your business may collapse. In 2020, you may have a headache and go to the hospital and you will be told you've got cancer. I'm going to teach this morning faith as is realistically presented by Habakkuk. That we are not always going to get the outcome we want but we will never not get the God we need. I can make you shout and stand 
I can say words like I declare and decree blessings to you for 2020. And by saying those words, I would not have lied because truly I do pray for you to be blessed in 2020. However, my prayer may not be the reality you will face. So then what should happen? Well, Habakkuk says it. On the days next year when you will pray and God will not hear you. On the days next year when you will need deliverance and it will seem that God has delayed. Have faith. In this chapter, what is faith? For Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, let me tell you what faith is. Faith is allowing God to walk away with you in the situation when everything else got lost. In this chapter, faith is God coming into the fire, pulling you out, but leaving your career behind. Sometimes God will save you, but leave your career to burn. Sometimes God will pull you out, but leaving your marriage behind burning. Sometimes God will pull you out, but leaving your body in the grave. Sometimes God will pull you out, but your finances will be in ashes. In this story, faith is when God doesn't change the outcome, but he simply guarantees that he will walk out with you. I want you to spend time reading the minor prophets who were speaking to Israel as they went to exile, because for me, these guys are masters of faith. Because they had to preach to a nation whose outcome was not going to change. It's easy today for bishops and pastors to bless us because the future looks bright. These guys had no bright future to face. There was a reality that they are going to die. And it was there that they needed to find out what is faith really when the outcome will not change. Amos, one of the small prophets, supporting his brother Habakkuk, would support what I've just said in a different way. He says, I saw a vision where a lion had eaten a lamb. He says, but then I saw the shepherd open the mouth of a lion. He says, then I saw the shepherd put his hands down into the throat of the lion. And what did the shepherd pull out? Only a piece of an ear and a piece of a leg. Mm. What was Amos saying? He was saying, you will be devoured one day, but rest assured. Though God may not save all of you. He will reach into the lion and pull out something of you. And that will be enough to keep you going till he changes the situation. We've come to the end of 2019. Some of you are not what you were when the year started. You are incomplete. The reality is that some of you seated here, you are a piece of an ear and a piece of a leg. This year devoured you. But this morning I've come to praise God through realistic faith that though the, year, the lion of 2019 devoured you, he did pull out enough of you to preserve you, to keep you, till he finishes his plan for you and I. 
For some of us here, blessed be the name of the Lord, 2019 was a good year for you. And it may be possible that 2020 is the year when you will be devoured. And for those of us who were devoured this year, we want to tell you in advance, have faith. We walked where you are about to walk next year. Just as you see us seated next to you right now, know that just as he saw us through, he will see you through. It may not be written all over our faces right now that we are pieces of an ear. That's because that is what faith will do. I say this again as I sit down. This morning, I don't have a blanket of victories that I can give you. Because that's not realistic. We are not always going to get the outcome we want. And sometimes we have to learn that faith is walking away with God in a situation when you lost everything else. Walk away with God. My prayer and request to you, whatever is going to happen in this life, when you've come to realize that you can no longer hold on to many of the things around you, I tell you, let go. And with your last strength, hold on to God. People go through depression and they commit suicide. Then you run around reading verses like those who commit suicide don't go to heaven. Firstly, that is a huge misinterpretation of what John was addressing. Secondly, I want to believe not all of us are going to conquer our victories, our battles. Except that before we breathe our last, we will walk away with God out of the situation. And so that's my prayer for you. And that's what I'm going to pray for right now. That whatever you go through in this life, walk away with God. Even if it is with your dying breath, walk away with God. Should the situation strip you of everything, walk away with God. Rise as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace this evening, this morning. With grateful hearts. We can reflect and say it is because of the Lord's mercies that we have not been consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. Father, I worship you and I thank you for those of your children whom, as I was preaching this message this morning, they lacked the experience of this pain. I thank you for them. And how I would desire that you would shelter those who have never gone through such experiences. How I truly wish that perpetual peace would attend them. I want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for those, for those in 2019 for whom you came through strong and bright. Let your name, Jesus, be honored and let all earth and heaven and all the created worlds, known and unknown, praise you, almighty God, for how you led many of your children this year. 
how some found jobs, others started businesses, others finished degrees, others made profits, others got promotions, others attended their last chemo for cancer, others were told by doctors that their HIV has gone deep beneath detection. Great things happened this year in your name. You are worthy to be praised. You should be honored and every tongue that is able should sing aloud, praise your name, the only true God. Let it be heard from down in the valleys to the mountain tops. Let songs reach out to the heavens to send praises to the Lord God Almighty for what you did for us this year. In this very same year, you led some of your children into the valley of the shadow of death. It was our turn. And as your children entered this valley, there are some of your children this year who lost their loved ones. Mothers died, fathers died, grandmothers, grandfathers died, uncles died, best friends died, daughters and sons died, brothers and sisters died. For some, it was a year where if hell could be described, we lived it. Some of your children this year were diagnosed with HIV, with cancer, with diabetes, with blood pressure, with all sorts and manner of things. Some of your children, Jesus, in 2019, they fell apart. Depression came, anxiety came. And we may be standing here, Lord, representing a portion of those pieces and ears that made it. And in hindsight, we know of friends and relatives that didn't make it. Those whom cancer took to the grave, whom HIV took to the grave, car accidents took to the grave, rape took to them to the grave, murder, hijacking took them to the grave, depression took them to the grave. So Father, we have also come before your throne of grace this morning. To humbly present those of ourselves who are not yet at the victory part of your leadership. And I've come to plead with you. Have mercy on us, O oh good God. Nothing we have that merits that we should not succumb where others succumb. I'm just pleading with you, have mercy on us. Deliver us, O oh great God. If it be possible, by your mercies and by your grace, do not allow us to walk this path again in the next year. Show us mercy and deliver us. For Lord, we do not want to claim to be Job. No Lord, we will not walk down that path. We thank you for what you did to him, but some of us are willing to admit we don't have that strength. We don't have that faith. We will not get to chapter 42. Have mercy and pull us out in advance. Yes, some are giants of faith. There are some who will be your jobs and they will be able to make it. But Lord forbid that if we are not Job, we should be subjected to his experience. For Lord, we are very clear, some of us. We will not be there at the end you would have lost us much earlier. 
Precisely because faith is very complex. It is not as easy as it may be described in books and sermons. To leave it God. To walk. To leave. To suffer. It is something else altogether. And you know because you suffer. Did you not yourself at the cross cry Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? Because finally when you lived like us, you understood. That it is not easy for everyone to shout, I have fought a good fight. So I would plead with you, Jesus. Have mercy next year. Have mercy, not all of us have that strength. Have mercy on our nation. We don't have enough strength for more girls to be raped and killed. Mm. Mm. We are drained. We have tweeted and retweeted enough. We have put up enough posters. We have marched enough. Have mercy. We can't do this every year. Look down upon us and show us mercy. We are depleted. In 2020, look upon us, the black nation. Have mercy. We've run out of patience being called monkeys, baboons. Lord, we are fast approaching a threshold where we can no longer handle to be oppressed in our homeland. I feel the rage when I hear your children speak on social media. Fast, the ropes that bind our patience are winning. Quick, the rainbow nation that we thought we were is disappearing. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy before we go through a Babylonian experience. Do not allow the Chaldeans to march through our land. Have mercy, Lord, because some of your children, for the past two, three, four, five, six, ten years, they've been unemployed. They have suffered. They have been told to start businesses they did so, didn't work out. At the door of business, they discovered bribes are necessary, which even they were too poor to afford. Have mercy. Your children are at a breaking point. Have mercy. They are not lazy. Some have gone to school believing that if they are educated, finally doors will open. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten years with a degree, a master's degree, nothing has opened. Have mercy, Jesus. Have mercy, Lord, because not everyone who gets cancer wants to be an activist. Not all of them are going to march and write books. Not everyone is going to be able to stand on TV and lead and educate. There are some of your children who have been diagnosed with cancer. They are lying in hospitals right now and they are pleading with you, let me die. Lord, speaking as a human, I know it is not a lack of faith in you. It is the knowledge that we are tired of suffering. Have mercy. 
if death is going to be what will give us rest. Some of us, Jesus, are tired of fighting. And Habakkuk is speaking for us when we say, if in our battle, you will be the only thing we will walk away with. It is well with us. We will take you and we will walk away to rest and wait for your second coming. Knowing that though we may have lost it all, we never lost you. We are able to say though there be no fig on the trees. And the fig tree does not blossom. Though truly, dear Jesus, for some of us in our bank accounts, in our fridges, there be no sheep in the pen. There be no knowledge of what we will eat tomorrow. Though for some among us it is true, there is no knowledge where we will live next year. What will be over our roofs, our heads as a roof. Yet we will rejoice in the Lord God of our salvation. Because in you is our faith. In you is our everything. So Lord Jesus, for me this morning when I say no cost, no sacrifice. I mean that I accept that the cost may be that I will lose everything. And that I will only walk away with you if that be my final fate, I still would have gained everything. Because I would have walked away with the one who matters more than anything. Because of that, I'm able to say now to him who is able to do. Immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. To him who is able to present us faultless and blameless before his throne of grace. To the only true God, invisible and incorruptible. Be honor and glory. As we navigate not only the end of this year, but the start of the new year. Holding on to you, Jesus, as the only thing that we are guaranteed in this life. Blessings I pray for. Amen. Prosperity I pray for. Victory, I pray for in the name of Jesus. Jesus name. Yet these are earthly goods. When time comes to an end and blessings have to remain behind and prosperity has to remain for the living, may you, Jesus, be our final portion. In your name we are.